question right from uh, the Kiefer School student, Ansel Emanuel. Uh, just last week on Wednesday night and Thursday, folks in the city of Long Beach and throughout the country and the world pause to acknowledge Yom HaShoah, which is Holocaust Memorial Day. In Israel, this day is marked by a two-minute moment of silence where the country comes to a complete halt. Throughout our city, folks mark the day by gathering to listen to survivors tell their story or pause to pray and remember silently. For those, who, for the millions who perished in a calculated genocide, in which people were murdered simply because they were part of a particular group. Tonight, I want to thank Rabbi Jack, who, congratulations, who was recently sworn in as a chaplain for our fire department, and the students from Temple Emanuel Hebrew School for coming tonight to explain to us and to present about this important day. So we're going to come, members of the council are going to come down here. All right, I'll ask the students to please line up. What's going to happen here in a moment or two is the students will be reading certain quotes from Ellie Wiesel. What I'd like to remind us is it's been said many ways, many times by many different people. Those who don't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. It's not so much remembering the past. Those who don't study the past are doomed to repeat it. Let me say it one time better. Those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. We live in very historical times. The threat to our democracy is real. When we think of Pittsburgh, shooting in San Diego, Charlottesville, black churches in New Orleans, South Carolina, the threat that is perceived of immigrants. We live in a time where the other has become challenged, threatened. We have to remember the lessons of the Holocaust so that they don't happen again. We've chosen six quotes to represent the six million that perished during World War II, the hands of the Nazi Germany. Right. I've asked the students to read a quote, but I've also asked them to pause for a moment or two after each quote, because I want you to listen to the words, I want you to ponder, I want you to think about what was being said by Elie Wiesel, a Nobel laureate, author of 57 books, author of the famous book Night. And so without further ado, uh, we'll begin this presentation. I'm hoping that it'll make you think and hopefully act upon these thoughts. I decided to devote my life to telling the story because I felt that having survived, I owe something to the dead. And anyone who does not remember betrays them again. Those who've been raised are superior. The religious faith is inferior. All collective judgments are wrong. Only racists make For me, every hour is grace. I feel gratitude in my heart each time I can meet someone and look at, at his or her smile. There may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. Without memory, there is no culture. Without memory, there would be no civilization, no society, no future. We must take sides. Neutrality helps the opposer, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormentor. No, and the last person is going to read the English translation of the Israeli national anthem. The quotes of Elie Wiesel are for intended to make you think about what happened during that most difficult time in history. But the idea is to end with hope. In fact, the name of their star-spangled banner is called Hatikva, 
which means in Hebrew, the hope. So the idea is from this terrible tragedy, from the ashes of the Holocaust, was born a nation, a refuge, a safe haven for the people who had no hope. <coughs> so we leave you with the English translation of the Israeli national anthem, which we stand in the shadow of Israel's independence. So long as within the inmost heart the Jewish spirit sings, so long as the eye looks eastward, gazing apart toward Zion, our hope is not lost. The hope of 2,000 years to be a free people in our land, the land of Zion and the land of Jerusalem. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you much.
Additionally, the Long Beach Police Department is partnered with local houses of worship to conduct active shooter training, which are tactics and strategies to help organizations improve survivability in the event of a shooting. As a reminder, Public Works crews will be flushing hydrants through Thursday, May 16th, between the hours of 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. Hydrants flush to remove iron deposits and sediment from the system. It also lets us know that hydrants are working properly. During this time, you may experience some low pressure or water discoloration, especially when flushing takes place in your neighborhood. When hydrants are open to flush the system, iron deposits can be removed by the high volume, high, high volume of water flowing through the pipes, resulting in a temporary and harmless discoloration of the water. The discoloration is from iron, which is naturally present in water, and builds up deposits along the inside of all water pipes. We suggest you keep a picture of clear water in your refrigerator, refrain from giving laundry between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. Once the hydrant flushing is complete, the water color will return to normal. The City of Long Beach 2019 beach passes are also on sale seven days a week at the Gazebo Building, located the crossing of the Long Beach Ice Center. The hours of operation are Monday through Friday, from 6 p.m. and the weekends from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. from June 22nd. With the first phase of the Army Corps project done, all of our beaches will be completely open this summer and looking forward to a wonderful season. Visit longbeachmy.gov slash beach for more information. And finally, congratulations to Long Beach's own Tariq Cole on being signed by the Arizona Cardinals of the NFL. Uh, we'd also like to congratulate Charlie McAvoy, the Boston Bruins, for moving on to the NHL Eastern Conference Final. On the island of the Rangers, we're rooting for Charlie to bring the Stanley Cup home to Long Beach this summer. All right. Thank you for that. We'll call the first hearing. Okay. Our first item this evening is a public hearing for the purpose of giving citizens an adequate opportunity to publicly present their views on the general summary of the proposed budget for the year. July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 
get back, get back to that uh, more in a moment. First, I'm going to dive right into this budget category. This year's budget contains a 7.9% tax increase for residents. You're going to hear me repeat that number often. I'm not going to gloss over that number. I'm not going to sugarcoat that number. Um, uh, there's not going to be any assembly on my part. And I will not do anything to portray it for anything other than what it is, which is a significant task of the taxpayers. Um, however, it's an ask that's absolutely essential in order to preserve the financial and operational stability of this place. That's what it's for. And to lay the groundwork for future growth. Um, at this point, the city's financial difficulties are pretty much a matter of crisis, right? Um, in my first week or two in office, our credit rating agency, Moody's, downgraded our, our credit rating to BAA2 status, which is two notches above drunk status. In addition, about a month later, the New York City Controller signed us a fiscal distress score of significance. That's the second year in a row we've received that designation and we're one of the few municipalities in New York State to do so. Um, additionally, there is a restructuring evaluation currently underway by a third state agency. So when we talk about the foundation for resurgence, what we're really attempting to do here is express two separate but related principles. Um, first, it's a candid assessment where we are right now. We acknowledge that. Um, but also, in a larger sense, it's a statement, if you will, on where we want to go and where this budget will allow us to go. So two things, location and destination. Uh, the proposed tax increase is 7.9% this year, which is slightly lower than last year's adopted tax increase of 8.3%. Now, while many people are automatically inclined to sort of assume the worst when you hear a number like 7.9%, it's also very important to keep it in perspective because the city accounts for approximately 35% of residents' tax bills with the school district and the county benefiting off the remainder. Therefore, in real dollars, a 7.9% tax increase equates to about a $300 increase for the average Long Beach household. Is that considerable? Yes. Hopefully, it's not insurmountable, particularly with the housing market being what it is in the city of Long Beach. I mean, what you have to understand really, though, is this. The city remains engaged in what amounts to a protracted course correction. Um, that course correction extends to before Sandy. Uh, for those who may recall, at the end of 2011, the city was borrowing from the payroll. That is not a sign of a healthy organization. To the contrary, that is a sign of an organization that is in dire financial straits. So as the city is grappling with that problem, Back in 2012, what happens in October, but Sandy takes landfall, um, completely decimates the city, and submerges it. Right? So many residents at that time were forced to discard all of their household and worldly possessions that they accumulated over the span of their lives. Right? And those were the fortunate ones. Right? Many of the less fortunate among us had to move out of our homes altogether for a period of months, and in some cases, years, until they were able to reconstruct. Forget that now. Um, but the city, in the, the years after Sandy, made a very deliberate policy determination. And the determination was it was as follows. Um, in the years after Sandy, the city suppressed tax hikes to every extent possible. And it did that in order to allow people to rebuild. Practically speaking, it's very difficult to impose tax increases on people who aren't even occupying their homes. And at that time, what you have to also understand is that the city had very legitimate concerns about the viability of its housing market and its tax base. In other words, we didn't know if people were going to come back at that time. Uh, therefore, state and federal relief funding was used for a number of years to plug the hole that by the revenue loss. So from both an economic and from a human standpoint, I mean, I have to say I wasn't a policymaker at the time, but if I was, I can't necessarily say, I wouldn't say, that I would do anything differently. What I might have done a bit differently um, in the immediate aftermath, after the immediate aftermath, the sort of pass was, and this is not a critique, I understand, um, so I probably would have tried to spread out the tax increases over a larger span of time um, once that, the end of the relief of it became visible. So that's to say, probably in about 2016 or so, 
Um, I wouldn't try to phase in some of these tax increases because um, it's, a, it's just a bit more palatable, a little bit less jar for the taxpayers. Um, make no mistake, however, a structural imbalance is a structural imbalance. You would have been in the same spot anyway. That is a fact, no matter which way you slice it. So as far as my introductory comments go, the upshot is really this. Um, Charlie, short tax increases would have been completely unbearable after Sydney. Uh, but with one Beach's housing market being what it is, and the resiliency measures that you see popping up all over the city, now is the time of course for act. So starting out, as you can see here, solid sound foundations. The well-being and viability of our city requires sustainable fiscal, environmental, and quality of life conditions. This budget's framework aims to ensure so uh, sound foundations are built to complement each other with the goal of bringing Long Beach to reach its full potential as a sub-charter city by the city. So by the numbers, just briefly, the proposed operating budget this year is $97.6 million. 85 million of which consists of the general fund, 6.4 is the sewer fund, 5.5 million of which consists of the water fund. And just to echo some of the remarks I made earlier, for every dollar collected in the city, 65% of those total taxes go to the school and to the county. The remaining 35% is what goes to the city. So the 7.9% proposed residential tax increase equates to a $304.63 per year, or $25.39 per month, average for the average mortgage home. So, uh, this is the first slide that I really want to hone in on and focus in on. It involves what we're calling realistic budget. The 2019-2020 proposed budget uh, responsibly right-sizes revenue and expense estimates laying a sound foundation for restoring the city's finances and financial credibility. As in the years past, increases in fixed expenditures have easily outpaced revenue increases. The proposed 7.9% residential tax increase only partially covers this year's budgetary shortfall. Other cost-saving measures will take you through these spending. And here's what we need to focus on. So if you look at this first number here, 0.62%, what is that? That's our debt service. Our debt service increase this year is about two hundred fifty-one thousand dollars, or that's a 0 0.62 percent tax increase in and of itself, just by itself. Then layer into that our increase in healthcare costs. Right, they're going up about five hundred eighty-six thousand dollars, or that's a one point four five percent tax increase by itself. Now layer into that the cost of contractual raises under collective bargaining agreements. Right, that's another $1,042,000, which is a 2.5% tax increase by itself. When those numbers are added together, you get a 4.65% increase in taxes just through fixed costs. That leaves the city 3.3% for everything else. These are fixed costs, they are sunk costs. So what we're really looking at here in terms of maneuverability is 3.3%. So what are we doing with that? These are just some illustrative examples. We'll be hearing a lot more from our financial consultant and our accounting consultant as the event progresses. But these are just illustrative examples of the things we're trying to do to responsibly right-size city revenues and expenses based on historical trend. That is the theme of this year's budget, adhering to historical trends. So for departmental income, We've reduced that by $208,000 to reflect unrealized budget and revenues, primarily attributable to the police department, the Ringer Steel. Um, in past years, for as long as we had this Ringer Steel, which is the device that takes pictures of the license plate as you enter town, we budgeted about $500,000 in revenue. We're cutting that dramatically this year. We're not eliminating it, and in the next meeting, we'll have Commissioner Hagen back to explain the plan for generating the revenue that we have listed in the budget. But for now, that is a prime example of the type of thing where we are trying to hew to the trends and put forward to the public what amounts to a reasonable, moderate budget. Um, also, licenses and permit revenue. We're reducing 
that by two hundred fifteen thousand dollars to reflect the reduction in building permit fees previously generated by supersonic sand. Again, this is, there's nothing we can do about this. We just have to be realistic about it and account for it properly. The same goes for the reduction in state and federal aid that's being reduced by four hundred forty-one thousand this year. And there's very little that we can do about that. Again, we are just simply trying to put forward an honest budget that reflects actual trends. Over time, that's a little bit different situation. We're actually increasing the overtime by 140,000 this year, um, which is, of course, you know, subject to criticism, and everybody understands that. But historically, what's happened is we haven't accounted properly for this expense of the year. Um, we have increased it by 140,000 this year to reflect the actual trends. However, it's also important to understand what we're doing on the other, which is implementing managerial oversight and control to ensure that people who work overtime aren't doing so simply to augment or complement their existing salary. In other words, we want people working overtime when the actual need for overtime exists. And those are the policies that we're trying to implement this year. I think that, um, from, luckily from my standpoint, having been with the city as long as I've been, I feel they're situated to help in that regard and we can vote attack on this challenge. Uh, next slide. A few things to say about this. So this is when we get into the topic of long-term financial planning. I don't want to um, step on Sandy's toes. This is the subject of their presentation. But there are a few important things that I'd like to run through this slide. First of all, um, you can see the first point there is restoring financial credibility. That's a term I've used often in the last couple of months. Um, we're working with partners to restore finances and financial credibility the New York State Control, the Financial Restructuring Board, uh, CMA, and our internal auditors, ABC. The important thing to realize about restoring financial credibility is this. The city has been almost locked in this, in this cycle, this feedback loop, where every few years, probably at six to seven years, um, some massive adjustment needs to be made and mass to address a structural imbalance that has ballooned and reached a critical mass. And when that happens historically, what you're seeing are very, very large tax increases because the numbers catch up to us. So if you go back to 2012, um, your residential tax increase that year was about 16%. Six or seven years, eight years before that, and I'm sure many in the audience remember this, there was a 25% tax increase at one point. This is a cycle, and this is what diminishes our financial credibility as we move forward. Um, it hurts our ratings, and ultimately, it's going to hurt our ability to enter into strategic partnerships and to go into business. Something has to be done. The cycle has to be broken eventually. The question is, of course, how do you accomplish that? Well, you start with the little things, right? And you make sure that those things go correctly. And then you start to work on the big things. This year, my first priority was to make sure that our audited financials were submitted to the federal clearinghouse on time and with less findings. That was something that was accomplished. All right? And we're very proud of that accomplishment. Um, it's something, frankly, that we should be working on regularly for it every year. But we have to do it. And if you want to restore your financial credibility with markets and business partners, this is how you start. Granted, it's training this, but it's a prerequisite for a financial turnaround. It has to happen. Another thing that, you know, I would want the public to understand is this. You know, when you're dealing with ABC, that's our internal auditor, they've been here twice in the last six months conducting audits. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever gone through an audit, but it's generally a very unpleasant experience. It is resource all right? You're unable to focus on all the other operational tasks and handle that you're here to work on. That's why we all take these jobs, to work on that stuff. Not to work on other responses. They've been here twice in the last six months. The New York State Controller has been here for approximately a year now. They are in the midst of their second audit, and in fact, they're conducting a third review right now on this very budget. So that's three, just from the New York State Controller. Um, and then you later in the financial restructuring board. Uh, we expect their analysis to hopefully be completed in about a month or two, although we can't say for sure. Um, however, we have been engaged in the information exchange with them for the better part of the year. So in any given moment, we have to drop everything in this building and put out a financial plan. And I you know I just want to compliment the staff for the way they've managed to handle that responsibility 
over the last several months. It's been intense. And it's important for the public to understand that, it, that is an essential first step to restore our financial credibility. Uh, the next topic, the next point you'll see, is a topic near and dear to my heart, that is recurring revenue streams. Uh, we're working to maximize existing revenue streams and identify additional revenues, primarily through smart with initiatives, but through others as well. Uh, if I can just say something on this topic, you know, when we talk about municipal finance, you know, it's not this, this mystical thing, it's not this esoteric thing that anyone, no one's capable of understanding. Right. If you want to balance your books in the public sector, there are three main ways that you can do it. Right. Two are on the revenue side, one is on the expense side. The two on the revenue side, the two main ones anyway, are raising taxes and expanding your tax base. We'll talk about the cost side in a minute. But in terms of the revenue side, you know, there are many ways to expand to, to expand your revenue. And we've, uh, we've done a lot this year to locate creative sources of revenue, such as the mortgage and fault registry, and we're now talking about you know, whether you like that. Yeah, you know, there are different ways to do parking meters. We're not fully sold on that concept, but we're exploring it. Um, the concept of the way station on the British Boulevard has popped up again. But the, the thing to realize is that these are all small scale initiatives. If you really want to tackle this thing in big chunks and allow services to continue in the city, you want to probably, I submit the answer is staring us all in the face. It's this housing market. We have an amazingly robust market. The house real estate market may be all on that. I mean, uh, all you can see what these convert, a converted bundle of those who are on the West End. It's just amazing. And the thing is, developers want to be here. What we need to do with these developers, this takes a while. Don't get me wrong. That's the downside of the current revenue stream to increase the tax base. Is that seed? It takes a long time. That seed sometimes to germinate. But what we have to do differently is we have to learn from what happened on the street block. That is a fun example of what not to do. You know, developers come in here, and instead of starting at the grassroots level with the community, they're starting somewhere else, and they're playing a game of position and argument, right? They're starting high and ending hopefully somewhere in the middle. But that is not the recipe to success in this city. That's not the way it goes. You know, I like to think of the example of the Hebrew Academy property, right? Uh, they're in an environmental review right now, and frankly, I've seen their plans. And had they just simply started where they are right now, there's a very substantial likelihood that that would be built already. And if that's there, you're talking about adding conservatively $800,000 to our tax base, maybe as high as a million by some estimates. That makes a huge difference. Huge difference on our budget in terms of sustenance of existing services. So these are the things that we have to start thinking about. Smart growth initiatives. There are ways to do this without talking about monstrous structures that are going to consume everyone and you know deal with more traffic or parking issues. There's, there's changes in demographics that uh, are really meant for a community like this, where you have cool walkable downtowns, walkable train stations. This is what people want, right? 45 minutes from Manhattan, a beach. What beats this? A gem. And we have to start thinking about ways to encourage development here, but also without killing the developers in the process, or having the developer kill us, or wind up the litigation with us. So that's the goal. You're going to see me start working on that immediately after the budget. Um, but again, the downside associated with expanding your tax base is going to take a while. So what do you do in the meantime? Well, that leads me into the third point here, which is reevaluating cost structure and service delivery model, working to identify savings opportunities and implement controls to keep costs manageable. The most common question uh, I've got on this budget so far is, you know, wow, that sounds great. What are you doing to tighten your bill? What are you doing? I get that. I understand this question. Um, for the past dozen or so years that I've been employed by the city, I've worked on the cost side of the equation. Right? I've worked on the labor side. And what I can tell you is this. Um, if you're talking about a workforce, 99% of which is unions, all right? there are a lot of constraints. You're dealing with things uh, in the payroll of the baby, things like charter amendment, interest arbitration, or even obscure 
doctrines such as past practice, which we explored a little bit at the last panel. Um, but that is static. So when you have an existing collective bargaining agreement, your maneuverability goes down tremendously. That is just the reality of the situation. So that being said, what is the one tool that remains left in the public employer's toolbox? It's layoffs. That's your only bargaining leverage. However, there are no layoffs included in this budget. I did not include that for a reason. Because I'm not prepared to have the financial restructuring report our experts coming back to us and guiding us through this analysis. I'm not prepared to fire indiscriminately into the workforce and guess as to what we should be cutting. That's why the financial restructuring board, that's why they exist. And that's what they're doing to help us right now. Um, and even when they come back, who's to say, what will happen? I can't guarantee anything will. But I can tell you this. There's a compounding effect that exists with the financial restructuring board. Uh, and that exists because they're not only going to try and isolate the school areas where you can cut, but they're going to try to provide incentives to do so. That's the compounding effect. Not just elimination, but providing additional funds to help that process along. So it would be crazy from a financial standpoint, from all of my opinion, to start making cuts when we don't have the guidance needed to do so. Um, that will happen eventually. But when, just by, um, just off topic for a second, when the upper B finally does come back with its report, we also intend to have CMA do a more dr drill down and deep hand analysis. So it's going to be sort of multi-phase um, multi, multi -phase and by and sort of two different kinds, it's called that, two prime approach to evaluating our workforce. The first is going to be by the financial restructuring board, and the second prompt will be by CNN. So I talked about the financial reasons for not doing that this time. But also, you have to think about it from a human perspective as well. Um, I'm not sure how many people in the audience have ever participated in a reduction in force analysis or in reality. I have. Rest assured um, that layoffs are the most unpleasant thing that any public employer could ever have to go through. You're telling an employee who has done absolutely nothing wrong that they can't work here anymore. All right, so from a human perspective, that is a crushing blow to an individual. It rips apart families, and it rips apart the community, frankly. I'm not saying it may not have to happen at some point in the future, but the least an employee deserves is, is a look in the eye when they're being told you know, why they would have to possibly be tough. And from a managerial standpoint, I would want to know why and how and when before, like I said, anybody cuts here in this um, And that's my uh, and that's my two cents on, on layoffs and why they're not included in this budget. Um, but that does segue into my final point, which involves setting performance benchmarks and utilizing data. Um, when the FRB comes back with their report, when CMA comes back with the revenue analyses and with their workforce analysis. It's important to understand this. You know, in this town, as we are all aware, there are very strong currents that run with respect to special interests. That has always been the case in the city of Long Beach. I'm sure that will always be the case. But at some point in time, we need to allow data, uh, empirical analysis, quantitative data, to drive our policy determinations. Right? Because you're seeing it again. These numbers, they catch up with you. They are like a ruthless predator. They're going to find you eventually. And when that happens, the bubble bursts, and there's another large tax increase. That's the cycle we're trying to break. And we're not going to break that cycle unless we can start to pay attention to these numbers and actually, and actually do something when we receive them. Right? That is the key. Let the numbers, let the data drive the policy. Sorry. The next two slides are really meant to just convey a couple of basic things. They're not budget specific, but they are in a sense because they deal with operations. And the finances and operations of the city, they are not separate and distinct, not mutually exclusive. They are one and the same, <coughs> finance and operations. But when we are constantly putting out financial buyers in the city, and I've been doing that every day since I got into office, that is my, that is my daily regimen, is put out the financial buyer of the day. But that has an opportunity cost is everything operationally that we need to be doing and that we shouldn't be doing. This first slide relates more to the need. So the things that we're looking to do over the, over the coming year, if we can just stabilize this environment financially, 
are accelerating rotary and the reconstruction. Everybody knows what that's all about. We replace the sewer main at the same time we pave roads and we do the streets keeping. That turns out beautiful. And it's fully functional. That is the proper way to do it. We just want to expedite the process. Uh, Army Corps protection project, that's almost complete. Uh, sewer consolidation. Let me say this about sewer consolidation. That has suddenly taken on a life of, of, of its own. You are all about to hear a lot more about sewer consolidation in the next month or two. It's no longer some abstraction. Um, it is heating up substantially. And I don't want to belabor that because, like I said, there's going to be much more discussion on that topic, but stay tuned. Also stay tuned for the next two or three months for the critical infrastructure bulk that I've read this channel. I'm happy to announce that last week we closed on the deal with the town of Hempstead to purchase the underwater property needed to construct the bulkhead, which will run from tennis bubble to the wastewater treatment facility. Um, we have a few things, a few uh, big ticket items left with respect to the bulkhead, the critical infrastructure bulkhead, including an agreement with the Long Island Railroad to, uh, to uh, figure out a way to use a deployable barrier, probably 80% of the way through that agreement. Once that's complete, uh, what you'll see next is you'll see us put it up there. <laughs> And you will see it uh, come up for finance as well, even though it's been, it's been fully reimbursed by FEMA funds, 100% cost share. So uh, that's the good news with respect to that. Um, and right now we do anticipate financing it through a series of bond anticipation rules. And that's why it's so important to maintain our financing, our financing rather than our structural stability. Because that does happen, and those interest rates are real. You know, $20 million, you know, it could be substantial. So um, also, of course, we, we never stop efforts to protect the Lloyd Aquifer. Saltwater intrusion is unacceptable at any level, and uh, you know, we have always moved forward to vigorously and zealously protect um, that aquifer as our sole source of water. Right? Now this delves into more of the area of the wants. These are the things that we want to focus on more. Once we have the core foundation and structural financial stability that this budget will afford, near and dear to any corporation council's heart is a draft comprehensive plan. Uh, this is inextricably tied to the revenue expansion that I discussed earlier in this presentation. Recreation, supporting and promoting Long Beach cultural, recreational, and artistic programs and initiatives. Reestablish boards, increasing community and staff engagement by reestablishing dormant boards and commissions. A brief point on this one. Um, we do anticipate reestablishing the ethics board within the next month or two. Very narrow mandate, though. Uh, I'm, I'm more excited about what we're starting to discuss in terms of forming either a quality of life committee, and we've reached out to several constituent groups about this already, um, and having them be an umbrella organization, or a committee rather, that has subcommittees, or perhaps reinvigorating the public safety committee and rolling into there. Um, but one of the things I'm trying to accomplish is instead of having all these separate items around town telling us they're very important quality of life concerns. I'd rather roll this into an umbrella group so they can help the city prioritize them. Because right now, I can tell you, we're getting information coming in from all over the city, and you need your head on a swivel to keep up with it. And it becomes a problem in terms of prioritizing it. So why not allow that, the prioritization of this, to rise up from the grassroots level? And I think we can start to do that through a committee, a following life committee. Uh, code enforcement, increasing emphasis on code enforcement as it pertains to quality of life issues. Um, well, this is not some type of abstraction. This is something that I've been working on very diligently over the course of the last several months. Um, all of our mail-in uh, funds for VCOs are violations of our code of ordinances. The mail-in funds have increased by a minimum of 50%. One of them increased by 150%. Um, there are several new ones. All of these relate to following life concerns. I'll run through this very quick for kind of CNA as well as patient. Um, but we'll talk about possession and use in Ocean Beach Park, consumption in public places, smoking and bathing on, in public parks, that's new. Bathing, no lifeguard on duty, new. On beach after hours, no beach pants, illegal entry, bicycle outside center, roller skates, skateboard, boardwalk, class on beach, uh, dog at large, nuisances by dog, dog on boardwalk beach, no dog license, use of public sewers, urination, that's the one that went off 150%, 150% by the way. Improper disposal, refuse, literally. Noise, first offense only, and bicycle on sidewalk ramp. You know, these are the types of concerns that I continually hear about from the citizens. You know, and we are listening. I think I was probably uniquely situated in my position as a corporation counsel to help um, 
negotiate the increase of these fines, which ultimately remains the judge's discretion. But we seem to have a consensus on what these mail-in fines would be. So we don't know what it's going to be in terms of revenue generation, and that's not the main reason why we did it. If it helps, great. If not, we're really going to put in the problem with that concerns. That's the reason we did it. A beautification, partnering with the businesses, community to enhance the downtown experience, ADA language and access, improving the public ADA, language access policy. That also includes the new website, which is nearly ready to roll. Be part, improving on our world class boardwalk and Ocean Beach Park, and the Long Beach Response App. Overseeing resident requests in the Long Beach Response App to ensure timely employee responses. You can see that with our new initiatives with uh, potholes, what we call pothole control. Is that it? Work like a chart. It worked out great. Slide. And looking ahead, while much has been accomplished in the past six years since the storm ravaged our community, we still have much left to achieve. The rebuilding continues both fiscally and physically. Our team is dedicated to working tirelessly with the taxpayers of the city of Long Beach. Again, to circle back to the initial theme of this presentation, what this budget is meant to do is build a foundation. The house portion of it, which I'm sure everybody is interested in, comes in two weeks from now when you hear the capital plan presentation. That is not possible. All of those initiatives are not possible unless they are built on unless they exist on solid financial footing. That is what the Foundation for Research is all about. I thank you all very much for your time and indulgence, and now I'd like to welcome up CNN. Thank
Um, among other things she's working with lately are uh, the um, town of Islip on Long Island. Uh, we have an upcoming engagement with Brookhaven. We work with Poughkeepsie on Long Island, uh, Riverhead, Garden City. So both very strong credits and some credits that are more challenged. So Margaret will lead the team for this engagement. I'm um, Jane Blanco, who's also with us this evening. He's the vice president of the firm. Jane has a myriad of skills, uh, one of which is that to find funding opportunities, grant funding opportunities, to fund the kind of work that we'll be doing with the city of Long Beach. Oh, certainly, as part of the engagement, we'll be looking for opportunities to provide funding for the services that we're providing. Um, other folks who are not presently with us, Jack Morley is a vice president with 25 years experience working on, on credit, in particular, company credit. Um, one of Janet's claims to fame is by joining our firm, uh, she worked for Warren Buffett. She's one of five people picked by Mr. Buffett to start up his municipal bond insurance company, which he started right after the fiscal collapse, the near collapse of 2007. So Janet is really a president for uh, Tom Kusakis and Evan Soitoro will also be providing support services. So what I'd like to do is ask the mic to, um, to Margaret to have her take you through the scope of services that her team will provide to the city. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to run through generally <clears throat> what our assignment is. It's in three stages, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to James to talk about the physical conditions, and then I will uh, come back to talk about the long-term plan. So uh, it, it's, this is going to take three phases. The first one is physical conditions. You need to understand and, and have a very deep understanding of just how you all got here and where you are today. Once we have that understanding and a basis for our analysis, then we can go through what we call a multi-year plan. The multi-year plan will be a five-year forward look at where we will be. You heard um, Rob talk about uh, you'll go through a number of years and all of a sudden you have a huge uh, tax increase. Well, if you don't look five years ahead and look at what the, the condition, the financial condition of the city will be on the, with those five years, what can be done to not have a, a huge increase? What we can do to, um, to plan out how those increases would have to uh, be implemented, that's, that's what the five-year multi-plan is. We've done this many, many times and we've We've worked with many, many municipalities that have been in dire straits, and we have gotten them not only through the five years, but we've also gotten them, some of them from junk to an investment grade rating. Here, what we want to do is improve your rating, and that, that's the real um, purpose of doing a five-year plan. It's something the rating agencies like, and it's something you all should, should understand and see, and we certainly want to give that to you. The last is the implementation plan. <clears throat> Once we look at the five-year plan and we plan out certain strategic steps that have to be done within the five years, then we want to make sure it's implemented. And we want to take that implementation and plug it back into the five years and see how, it's almost like a scorecard. How have you done? Where are you? And where will you be in five years? And that's basically what our job is. Uh, and we'll go in a little more detail about that. So I'm going to turn this over to James, who's going to talk about the physical conditions analysis. Good evening. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. So I wanted to talk about the physical conditions analysis. As Margaret had mentioned, um, our engagement is going to be essentially done over three pieces. The fiscal conditions analysis you can consider as a past and the present. Where have we been? Where are we today? How can we improve on that? What we're going to do is we're going to start coming in looking through you know, various operating budgets, financial, audit reports, any information that's going to be available to us. We want to define what the fiscal conditions are as of today. So we're going to start assessment of those fiscal conditions. This may include things like benchmarking, 
secure jurisdictions, trying to develop a baseline for our assumptions. We're going to develop a number of analytical tools. Again, things like those benchmark analyses. There's going to be a number of different analyses that we're going to be speaking to the city about as we move forward and we go through this process. And those, the purpose of those is going to be for us to help the city to develop some corrective action measures. Again, this evening, a lot of discussion has surrounded about structural uh, imbalances. We want to improve upon that. We want to bring structural balances into the city's uh, finances. We want to correct that. We want to preserve the credit rating and at a future date enhance that credit rating. Some of the items that, that we spoke about uh, while we're doing this uh, fiscal conditions analysis, we want to review environmental factors. What are the needs of the community? What resources are available to the community? We discussed a lot this evening about economic development. We want to look at property value trends. All these different things that have a significant impact and can have a significant impact on the city. Again, the whole point of this analysis is going to be so that we can look long term. One thing that we've seen with um, particularly entities that do have some level of fiscal stress, it's very easy to lose sight of the future. You're looking to put out fires on a day to day, day basis. You want to look to those future steps and to go through each of these processes to help the city get back in a structural position um, where they're going to be able to look in the uh, future direction. Organizational factors. We're going to be reviewing the different policies and procedures that are currently in place, management practices, um, the local environment, the state, federal policy environments. Um, one thing that uh, Richard had mentioned before, we do represent approximately 450 different jurisdictions across the United States. It's very important. That helps us to you know, have a, a sound and solid understanding of the local finance law, the general municipal and a lot of the, the laws that govern um, how, how the city is going to be moving forward. We'll look at different financial factors, the types of revenue sources that you have available, what you're spending your, your funds on now, your trends in fund balance levels, the debt obligations that are outstanding, all these different things are going to factor into this fiscal conditions analysis that we're going to perform. And again, the key parts that are going to be evaluating the data that's presently available to us, benchmarking it, and identifying key trends. We'll compare this to a written analysis that we'll publicly present um, as the wish of Rob and the city. And it's going to have a number of both initiatives and recommended um, corrective actions. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mark. We're going to talk a little bit more about the next step, which is going to be the multi year planning component. Thank you. This is my favorite part. Just like, what is going to happen? What are you planning? 
What does it look like? What does the housing market look like? How is that going to affect the taxes? We're going to have to look at all of that, and all of that will be in the plan. Um, and service fees. We're going to look at the service fees. Are they reasonable? Are they low? Are they high? We're going to look at those. If they're high, we're not going to trend them up because it probably probably be about the highest they can be over the next five years. So we're going to, we're going to look at that. Key drivers. What are the drivers of your economy? Recur again, recurring one shot. Sensitivity analysis. Trends, reductions, opportunities, and mismatch. Those all go into this five-year plan. The final steps are we will come up with what we believe of corrective actions. Those will be our, uh, our suggestions. Realistic operating budget, a follow through, and a sound, sound fiscal plan. What we want to see over the next, we hope, way before five years, hopefully within two years or three years, that we start to see financial health and that we can look at possibly improving the credit rating. We for sure want to stabilize it. So that's that's our goal, and if we can achieve that, we'd be what we consider pretty successful. How do we implement this? Annually, we're going to test that five-year plan. We're going, to, we're going to assess the progress of the plan. We're going to look at grants. That's something, as you heard, James is an expert, so we will be doing that. We will look at associated um, offset costs associated with the plan. The credit rating, develop a comprehensive rating strategy, and enhance the existing credit rating. That's generally what we're going to be doing over the next year, hopefully shorter, to really get this, uh, get the city on its financial uh, road to success. That's what we're hoping to do. Now I'm going to turn it over to Richard, who's going to talk about the credit rating. I apologize for the beautiful chair here. Uh, but as I said initially, um, when I made my opening comment, the cost of our firm, the fund that I'm primarily involved in is the debt side. Um, planning, structuring, issuing debt on capital projects and cash flows. And market heads up, you can tell them, but they always overlap. And this is how they overlap. Um, whenever you're in the market, when you're in the bond market, you're borrowing long-term debt to finance capital projects. Required to get a bond uh, credit rate. Credit rate has to take place within 30 days of the sale date of your, your debt. Um, Moody, which is the primary rate agency that is uh, rates all credit in New York and across the country, that has either of either, either two other rate agencies, uh, Stanley Ford and Fitch. This is how they uh, find credit rate. 30% of the rating is based on economic and demographic factors, such as your property taxes, income levels, unemployment levels, who your largest taxpayers, who your largest employers, and what's the stability of your largest taxpayers and employers. 30% of their rating is based on your finances, the finances of the given jurisdiction, your budget to active performance, whether you generate operating surplus to your deficit, and you have fund balance, reserves that you can rely on to give you a 20% of the rating is based on your outstanding debt, how quickly you can pay it, the purposes for which you issue debt. Um, pensions also part of that, your OPEC liability. What, what are you obligated to pay to your employees once they retire? And the last part of your uh, credit rating is based on your management. Who runs, who runs the city? What's their background? What's their education? Their experience? Their tenure? Et this is important. People talk about junk rate. Um, prior to being a financial advisor, I was a banker. And when I was a banker, I was not allowed to bid on paper that was, that was rated below the A category. So if your credit rating is below A, you lose a, the entire sector of the market. You might lose maybe half the market, so no longer. Their internal credit policies don't allow them to bid on your debt. So presently, the city is rated GAA2. So you're in the lowest investment grade, grade but you have a negative outcome. So an investor who presently buys Long Beach paper at EAA2 with a negative outlook, he has to assume, because of that negative outlook, that the paper very likely will go below the current rate while he's holding it. So while he's the 
below BAA2, there's only one more step, BAA3. That's still investment grade. And if you slip below BAA3, then you're junk bond status. And you go market access is severely limited. Yeah. This is this is to me probably the most interesting slide that I that I talked about. Um, we subscribe to a service called Municipal Market Data. Every business day of the year, they provide interest rate scales based on credit quality and based on what occurred in the market that day. So this is the interest rate scale from um, May 7th. What we're trying to show you here is the difference in cost of capital based on credit rates. So if you would issue, say, a 10-year security that was going to mature in 2029, if you look at the columns of the right, if you're an A-rated credit, that 10-year security is probably going to pay a yield to an investor of about 185 if you're, uh, if you're a triple F. There's a couple of dozen triple A jurisdictions in New York State. We represent most of them. And um, especially in the current market, where there's a lot, not a lot of debt out, um, being sold in the market because of uh, a change in the tax code that Mr. Trump put into play, um, triple A credits are outperforming this MMP. But again, 10 year pay for AAA, they could expect to pay about 1.85% of the investment. If they drop into the AA category, they'd pay about 197 to their investment. So 12 basis points higher. There are 100 basis points and 1% of the If I go further to the A category, they would drop another, if their cost of capital would go up an additional 24 basis points. And if I go to the AA category, where the city currently finds itself would be an additional 34 basis points. So again, if we look at AAA versus BAA, we see a delta of about 70 basis points. Um, the city currently has outstanding a little over $100 million in debt. Um, 70, million, 70 basis points on $100 million in debt is over $750,000 in additional interest expense that you're incurring each year. And your debt might be outstanding 10, 15, 20 years. It adds up very quickly. So one of the goals of Mark and James and doing what they're doing is to get you back on the sound of this footage. And that ideally will result in higher credit ratings, better market access, lower cost of capital. Now you're spending your money on the needs of the city rather than on debt service, which is a very admirable goal to be achieved. Um, I think the last one, and again, to James, just to the last point, in terms of what's been accomplished thus far in the last couple of weeks for the city. Just to finish off this evening, uh, our gate has commenced for the city. Uh, so we have highlighted here a couple of things that we've started as kind of our initial. Uh, <laughs> starting points. Uh, the first one is during the fiscal condition analysis, we're going to be looking at uh, Christian levels, current staffing levels. We'll do a hiring analysis just to see if, if employees are adequate and if they're uh, matched to the proper positions. Uh, we've commenced some work looking at uh, a beach pass benchmark study. We've looked at some of your peer jurisdictions. What types of fees are they charging for the permits uh, on their beaches? We're comparing them against the city's fees, trying to determine if fees are adequate. Perhaps be increased if there's other fees that could be realized by the city. Uh, we've started looking and developing some, some uh, short term credit rating uh, tools. We've started to look at a couple different vehicles in the city's fleet and how those vehicles are being secured. As there are engagement progresses forward, this is probably an area that we'll stand out on. We might look at um, procurement for other vehicles that are, that are within the city's fleet and grant procurement. If you're going to tell the in every step that you know, has along the process. As we're making recommendations, we want to mitigate the cost to the extent possible for the city. We're going to be looking for ways to fund these different initiatives to make, uh, you know, to, to make it more uh, effective for the city. Um, as we move forward during our, our multi-year planning phase, we're going to be completing a comprehensive five-year plan that can be adjusted. Um, we want to be able to take these initiatives that we're looking at for planning and implement them into that plan and see what the net effect's going to be on the city years forward. The operation budget is what Rod has talked a lot about tonight. The goal of what our job is going to be is to move that operating budget forward, to move it into the five-year 
We may look at different policies that are currently in place. We may make recommendations to develop some policies. Again, that's a, that's a key driver. Uh, as we start to review the credit rating and um, some of the credit rated um, factors, fiscal policies go a very long way, so we may make some recommendations regarding that. Um, certainly, as, as the agent progresses, there's going to be additional objectives that, that are identified. Um, if we come up with additional ideas and bring them up to the city, the city has other areas of things like us to review and to look into, and certainly um, we we'll want to be aware of that. With that. Okay. Opportunity to present their views on the summary of the budget. 
they spent more time talking about ACM than you did on your slideshow. That is a disgrace. If you wanted us to be able to say, it should have been before you hired them. You also started your talk, Mr. Agatisi, by saying when you took office a short time ago. How many years have you been working with the city? He was referring to as acting city manager. Yes, I understand that. But he's been here in a very important position for many years. Ten, I think. Is that right? No, more. More? Can you answer the question then? Yeah, sure. Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half. Okay. You talk about building a foundation. After twelve and a half years, it, you should be on the fourth floor by now, not the foundation. We're starting at the beginning. And that is ridiculous. You let Jack Schneerman borrow and borrow and borrow, and nobody said a word about him, about stopping him. Financial credibility could have been enhanced if you had hired a comptroller, a full-time person. That's money. That's about finances. You bragged about getting your financial something or other in on time, as though that's a big deal. Getting things in on time is what we're so proud of. You've missed dates for grants in the past, too. I mean, it's ridiculous. All the audits you talked about, that should be an embarrassment. Um, you're talking about all the things that you've done. You're tightening your belt. I see on the new hires, Mike Robinson, who I like. Mike is a very nice guy. But he's been hired for two more positions. How many is that now? His name is up there twice. And then you also talk about money that you can't do anything about because it's union. Well, maybe get somebody who can negotiate. Do something about their health costs. Do something about all these raises. Do something about your six-figure hires that you've had since we've been in this position. Take some cars away from the people who are taking them home at night and using them as their personal automobiles. There's a lot of things that you can be done. Now you're talking about starting um, uh, groups of people, talking about ethics and everything else. We've been asking for that for years, years. Your hands are not tied. If you had the nerve, you would be a stronger negotiator. I'd like to know how many days and how many hours the city council all met together to talk about this budget. I bet it's a very small number. I have a lot more to say. Thank you, Ms. Hedges. Thank you, Ms. Hedges. Yes, Ms. McGinnis? Name and address, please. Karen McGinnis, Long Beach. Uh, first, I want to comment on the presentations. I want to remind everyone that the city manager does and always has reported to the city council. The cycle of ballooning taxes every six to seven years is directly tied to our elected officials kicking the can and it must be broken by people who put people before politics. In my own experience, audits are not painful if you have experienced professional staff on board and sound policies and procedures. Finally, my candid assessment for the residents I talk with is that we do not have confidence in this administration, which seems to have awoken from their year and a half slumber to finally put the city on course. It's just too little, too late. On to the budget. Has the acting city manager given the city council members a list of discretionary expenses that can be cut or reduced to lower proposed tax increase? And if not, why? Um, for the general fund account called termination salaries, there's 1.6 million budgeted. In light of the unexpected need to do additional bonding late in the current fiscal year, have the council members been given the salary schedule that makes up this number for the next budget so they can confirm it's reasonable or decide it should be adjusted up or down? Because Small Beach has been authorized to use debt obligations to fund our operating budget, the city has to submit the proposed budget to the New York State Comptroller's Office so they can provide an independent evaluation of the reasonableness of the revenue and expenditure estimates in the proposed budget 
and end analyze the composition of revenues and expenses in order to determine if the budget is structurally balanced. Has this been done? When do you expect to receive their comments, or have you already received them? And have the comments and recommendations by the New York State Controller's Office for this new budget been shared with each city council member? In order to do the analysis, the New York State Controller's Office requires additional information. A projected general fund balance as of June 19, along with projected significant positive and negative variances explanations for large variances between budget and actual for the completed fiscal year, pertinent information concerning salaries and salary increases, debt payment schedule. Has that information been submitted? Has the information been shared with each city council member in order to help them analyze this budget? It's also required that the council shall review each recommendation from the controller's office and make adjustments to its proposed budget consistent with any recommendations made by the New York State Controller. In, the, in addition, any recommendations that the Council rejects are required to be explained in writing to the New York State Controller. Will all the City Council members get the opportunity to decide which recommendations by the Controller's Office are accepted or rejected? Thank you, Ms. Aguilas. Uh, uh, can I can see Manager, can you speak to the Controller? I know we did submit them. <coughs> This budget, in terms of this budget. Right, the review is underway. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The review, the controller review of this budget is underway. I just found the office yesterday. Okay. Um, and all the information that you were required to submit to the controller's you, office, has that been given to the city council members so they can analyze the budget themselves? We don't have a copy of the budget. Right. No, the supplemental materials that were sent to the controller's office so that you could actually analyze the budget. Have each city council member been given all those supplemental materials? I can't say okay. Thank you, Mr. McGinnis. Thank you. I ask, I also ask, thank, thank I ask the controller's office will be, if the city council Mr. members will be you. able to accept. There's a lot of people that want to speak. I have a question. Answer the question. The purpose of this hearing is to correct your views. My view is that my position is to review this budget. In order to do that, they need information. So, do you have they gotten that information? I've got a couple of items. Where you said staffing and competence, right? Can you expound on that? It's in the New York State Controller's letter that that the City Council and the City Manager received. Have they gotten that information? I. These people are elected so that I don't have to read the budget. But if they don't get the, the information, then how are they supposed to vote on the budget? You're asking for the information you're asking for your welfare. This is pertinent for elected officials to make rational budget decisions. You cannot okay. make you vote on a budget in a vacuum. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, please. We always are very You told me to sit down. Excuse me, we're well, three minutes is on this because we also say that we can and will absolutely respond to all accounts and requests in a very timely fashion for anything you want. Especially in case of budget, this is your principal responsibility. So you and I are in agreement. Thank you. Next speaker on the side here. On the side. Ms. Trustin, I see you in the back there.
know why not? Well, you know, in the council's defense, there was a question about the open meetings alive recently. That was that was resolved. I believe that the resolution will facilitate a meeting with the council when they so desire. So, will it be an open meeting? That's not for me. Whether it's going to be a work session or not is not for me to determine discretion. So, I, I can't answer that question. Mr. Arama, will it be an open meeting? That will be a discussion for the council to have to decide collectively. Well, if it is an open meeting, I hope that you will extend its invitation to the residents of the city of Long Beach. Thank you.
Fiscal year 2020 proposed, 159,000. Are there planned civil service exams? If so, have we budgeted for those positions? Police fees, 2018 actual, $110,000. Fiscal year 2020 proposed, $250,000. How, do how does the city plan to increase police fees by $140,000? Ambulance charges, fiscal year 2018 actual, 1.089 million. 2020 proposed, 1.12 million. Why is the city only expecting a $35,000 increase in ambulance fees? The city significantly raised ambulance fees back in September. Is this raise accounted for? Recreation camp fees, $234,000, 2018 actual. 2020 proposed, $350,000. Why does the city expect a $100,000 increase in camp fees? Court fees, fiscal year 2018 actual, $368,000. Fiscal year 2020 proposed, $485,000. To increase court fees, does the city plan to issue more tickets, increase fines, or do something else? Does this line item include building inspection and code enforcement fines? If so, how much does the city collect in code enforcement slash building inspection fines? Parking violations, fiscal year 2018 actual, $400,000. Fiscal year 2020 proposed, $525,000. Decrease parking fees, does the city plan to issue more tickets, increase fines, or something else? Um, some of my spending questions are um, internal controls for reducing overtime. Are there, there are several budget reductions in overtime across many departments. What internal controls so are in place to that, ensure that that's, overtime that's is active? Many. I think, uh, Christy, you have these questions printed out in front of you, right? So we'll run, we'll run through them. Um, yeah, so your, your time is up. Sorry, Mr. President, I'm just Mr. Barron, understand something about your questions. There are no more or less important every other list of questions that we receive. So they are handled to but understand something, that our accounting consultant, Ms. Hanson Heimpower, was busy helping me prepare presentations. So the fact that you simply wanted your questions answered ahead of this meeting doesn't dictate my policy, okay? We have, actually, we have gone out of our, excuse me, we have gone out of our way. We have gone out of our way to get the answers to most or all of your questions. But understand something, there's no, there's no reason to come up here, to come up here and be rude or demeaning to anyone. So please bear that in mind for future comments. Thank you. That I don't manage to say, I just want to hear Ms. Ms. Pinehauer answer your questions now. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Oh. Wow. <laughs> so the third fees are going from about $100,000 to 160 is directly linked to the foreclosure registry that you asked about later on. Yeah, thank you. Civil service charges are related to plan civil service exams. However, it's just exams. There are no plans to create new positions related to these exams. Police fees, we are adding plate reader revenue. I believe Rob mentioned that Commissioner Tagney will come up to speak about that a little bit later. As far as ambulance charges go, we did increase rates back in September. However, for the past few years, we have not met our revenue projections. Therefore, we did not include an increase until we know what we're going to see. So that we're more realistic in our budgeting. Uh, recreation camp fees, there was a local camp that is closing and is not going to be in existence for the summer. And there is a plan with the recreation and that camp to funnel all of those camp members to the Long Beach camp this year. In addition, they will pay more than regular residents and we are also raising regular camp fees as well. So that's why camp fees are going up this year. Um, the court fees and parking violations are the same, two sides of the same point. Rob had mentioned earlier that the city has already increased the fee on now which is a large portion of the revenue. So that should basically you know, conservative projections on the increased revenue based on those, those fees that have already been increased. And I think that's everything you can do. Uh, yeah, well, well, do you have any other questions that you can answer for the public, or am I going to come up and answer these? I want to thank Ms. Hightower for taking the time out of her busy day to, to generate the answers. <laughs> <laughs> They want solutions, but they don't want to give information. They want specifics, but they're not willing to give specifics. And I thank Ms. Hightower for answering all my questions. Sure, but you. at the same time, for you to just say, oh, how can you expect us to answer questions? I think, you know, that's the meeting. That's wrong. And this is why we need a permanent, qualified city manager. Thank you. I hope you bring the same Okay, so with all the respect,
29, just for the record, federal uh, CPI is 6.2. That's what we have in our social security. Uh, you've uh, more than taken that away last year, taken away this year. Pretty soon, that's the best one. But um, the, race, uh, you know, the CPI from the Fed is 2.8, so we're well, well in excess of the uh, inflation rate by, by the federal government. Um, increasing over time, that's the wrong thing to do. Over time leads to lack of productivity and sick time. Controlling costs, that's done by controlling the people. If you're not controlling the people, then um, then they're going to spend more time, be less productive, and um, and abuse the benefits. We can't use uh, benefits as cash cows for retirement, which is why we're borrowing money that we can't pay. You have to start rewriting these contracts to make them. Um, the contracts are, are controlling the city. We're not controlling the contracts. That's what's happening right now. Um, I noticed uh, something walking on the boardwalk, that there were cameras in front of rip tides on our light poles. Are they rip tides cameras or are they hot cameras? If they're rip tides cameras, are they paying for them? They're hot cameras. How come they're only really rip tides? Why aren't they anywhere else? They spam from the boardwalk. All right, so let's go. All right, I didn't see them anywhere else on the boardwalk. They, they are in other locations. We don't like that. It's obviously where they are. Though. All right, uh, I noticed uh, the other day uh, power washing in front of uh, the 18 feet building on, uh, on um, regular national park. Twice, city employees, because they had to be employee uniforms, they had the truck there. So, I was saying, are we in the uh, power washing business for uh, um, sidewalks? Hey, look, I'd like to have one done. This is the corner of Arizona and um, anyhow, one little bit of advice. I give this to everybody I talk to. I mean, I talk about tax increases. Came out in the 90s. Just vote no.
Torino in the budget. I don't see that shown here. I'm wondering if the city can expand on where those are and where those went. Also, looking at, um, I remember hearing there was a shortfall involved in beach revenues. I'm looking at on page 44, beach charges, uh, 2018 actual 3.86. Year to date, actual for 2019 is 1.7 million, but you're still holding on that we're gonna bring in $4.275 million this year. Uh, this current fiscal year, are we gonna pull out $2.5 million over the next month and a half or two months for, for beach passes? And how's that gonna affect next year's beach passes, sale, revenue, expectation? Because um, I keep hearing that we had shortfalls and this looks like we haven't taken full account. I could be wrong, but that's what I wanted to ask a question on. Um, also, Talking about anticipatory notes, I see somewhere here, and I would like for it to be expanded on, what is a, um, hold on a second, I have it here. Revenue, uh, it essentially said bond anticipatory notes. Are we utilizing bonding to float this year's budget? I think I saw somewhere in the tune of $1.7 million. Remember last year, it looks like it was $2.1 million, dropped down to $1.5 million, so that was the difference in bonding. But are we starting off our budget year expecting to bond $1.7 million as part of revenue? Thank you. Thank you. So then we're not structurally balanced. I'm sorry, I'm trying to understand, I'm not trying to argue. I'm 
But the, the, the beach revenue is calendar year versus our budget, which is from July. So we get revenue after July from last year, counts to beach revenue last year, and then whatever money we collect right now is for beach revenue from last year. Well, last summer, but it's still business. Last one. Yeah. Right. 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 But I think that's where there's some confusion, though. It, it's, it's the money we're collecting now right. for beach revenue mm -hmm. goes toward the shortfall from last year. This year. That's what I mean. Not this much. No, it's not this much. It's not no, this much. Not. That's what I mean. When I said last year, I mean last year's budget. Yes. We're saying the same thing. Well, I think that's more of some of the confusion, even just us two talking about it. We're saying the same thing. Okay, I just hope it gets figured out so we can balance the budget as soon as it's safe. It sounds like it is happening, or the modification is not going to that we're going to. If you're talking about budget that's already adopted and been reviewed, there's no modification to our current year revenue to next year's budget. They don't relate. Do uh, you say so? Okay. Um, <laughs>
Name and address for the record, sir? Sure. My name is Brian Keller, and I used to live at 636 Westchester, and now I'm renting. I'm one of your uh, tax casualties, and that's okay. My wife's back there. We're retired. Uh, and you're right. The housing market is there, but if you don't think the tax increases and the financial stability of Long Beach was it a bargaining chip in those negotiations, you're misguided. We raised three lovely children in Long Beach. They were all in their 30s, and not one of them can afford to live in Long Beach. That is a tragedy and a travesty. Your, your children that you raised in this town can't even afford to live here. You're looking for Manhattanites to come down to the beach where you're right. As a marketing chip, yeah, we're 45 minutes from Broadway. You're right. But I'm a little bit upset. And more with your predecessors than anybody else. If Jack was here, I'd like to have his hide nailed to a barn door, I tell you. The truth. And not only that, he got a, got a bonus on the way out, and that's worse. Yeah. So, you know, I know it's going to go through. There's nothing, I, I feel sorry for the people that bought the house. They're a young couple with a, a, a young child, and they're going to get banged right away. Welcome to reality, and welcome to Long Beach. And I love this town. I love the beach. I'm an ocean swimmer. I run ocean swimming events. But... You know, I, I got to tell you, the leadership in this country, in this state, and in this town, I don't know what to say except that I'm extremely disappointed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So that's basically from your audit. So the 7.9 could really mean 9.9. I still, I asked this question a while ago, of course, I never got an answer, but I don't understand why the audit's saying it's one thing and you guys are saying it's something else. Now, you, you say you're implementing managerial control on overtime. Unbelievable. Now you're implementing managerial control? Now? What's happened all these years? Spencer time, Mr. Lester. I'll just ask uh, Christy Hightower to speak to the, uh, the audit increase versus the budget increase. Was that, do you know what, know what Mr. Lester was referring to? Which audit, which increase is talking about? There are no audits going into the tax I don't believe it's just this. I don't believe it's 2020. Which audit and which fiscal year? The last audit. Did you look at the last audit? But it's not for this budget. No, it's not for this budget. Okay. 8.3 was last year. 8.3 was the residential tax rate increase. Oh, so not the overall tax rate. We're not talking about the same panels. No, no, no. The audit, the audit is for the whole tax levy versus the 8.3, which is for tax rate of homeowners. So, so when you're talking about taxes, and if you look at the taxes in your own budget, the taxes are going up 12.2%. That's Tax revenue. I agree. Mm -hmm. What taxes are we talking about? Is somebody else coming in and paying taxes? Well, again, we're talking about the residential tax rate. There is still commercial taxes. There's also special assessments. And for rather than all rolled into the tax levy, they're two different. So the, when the, this year's budget we catch a 12.2% increase. No. Who's that in? On the levy. On the left, yes, but not to the individual homes. I'm sorry, can you look at page 44? And where it says to be raised by taxes, proposed 45 million three hundred eighty-eight thousand five hundred forty one. And last year it was revised to forty million four hundred and fifty three thousand three hundred and thirty-seven. That's a twelve point two percent increase. So on the levy. On the levy, how are you? On, on the amount, yes, on the amount raised by tax. Yes. That's 12% increase. Thanks. But it's disingenuous to attribute that for the homeowners. Yes, Mr. Gosselin. Good evening, Angela, sir. Uh, good evening, Jacob. Good morning. Uh, if I may, I, I think I can summarize Mr. Ekpichon's uh, plan to attack our current fiscal situation uh, as large tax increases, promote overdevelopment, fine residents over trivial offenses, and cut numbers. That's not the way that you balance your budget. The city has a problem on its management side, very popular. You just hired another uh, assistant city manager to the tune of $48 an hour. You multiply that by 2,000 hours of uh, work a year, it's about $98,000 hour. I don't understand it. I, I, don't, I don't get the need for it. Uh, you know, one of the complaints from Mr. Agatisi was that we're stuck with exorbitant personnel costs and basically laid that at the feet of the union workforce and others to whom the city has contractual obligations and of course his favorite whipping boy, the tail law. But none of these tie your hands with regard to your exempt management employees who have been getting raises despite the city having no obligation to give them a We're at a time of fiscal crisis. This is not the time to give out raises that the city is not obligated to give. Second, hospitals. In the city's exemption impact report, I've mentioned this before, uh, the hospital property. Uh, one of the exemptions listed in your impact report is $8,930,028 to a hospital. We haven't had a hospital in this town since then. So why are they still being given a free ride in the tax on the bad tax property when they're, they're not providing a hospital service to the community? Likewise, the how property is sitting there dormant for a long time though. It's no longer serving as a school. I don't know why they should be staying. The city should, if the city wants to collect taxes on those two parcels alone, there is no increase. They're paying taxes. 
and not what they should. Regarding the CMA guys, I'm sure they're going to be no different than the ICMA. I'm sure that you guys are going to tell them what you want them to tell you at the conclusion of the report, and they're going to give you that. Bottom line with any expert you hire is garbage in, garbage out. They're only going to be able to work with what you guys give them. And they're at the mercy uh, of the city's willingness to be forthcoming. And that's something that we know that this administration is not. Uh, Mr. Ixc continues to refuse to expose the illegal appoint, uh, employment agreement despite multiple requests from multiple different people in multiple different <coughs> scenarios. So why should we have any confidence that the city is going to be honest with the CMA? They, they can't do it if you guys are going to give them unreliable information to do it with. Not that I have any confidence that they're not going to be doing you a bidding anyway. I would just like to address this myth of a top-heavy uh, administration. Um, in, the, in the early 2000s, there was over 28 exempt employees. Right now in the city of Long Beach, there's 14 exempt employees, 14 of which are attorneys. So it leaves us 10. No, oh, I'm sorry. 14 exempt employees, four are attorneys. I said that backwards, sorry. So to think we're top-heavy is just, it, it, it's just lost hope. Um, and these employees do deserve raises, um, and there are minimal raises in here, and last year they, no one got a raise. Um, you know, these are the manager, this is the management team of the city. Um, this is who guides the city and runs the city. And if you talk to any of the uh, exempt employees, they're all overworked. Most of them carry two titles now um, and do more than one job. Uh, so to think we're top heavy, when Rob said we're 99% union employees, he's correct. We are over 99% union employees. Um, and so for any city manager to surround himself by a team that he thinks is going to get the job done for him and, and execute the vision of the council and the city manager is totally and 100% appropriate for someone that's sitting, in essence, the CEO of a $97 million operation. Um, and to have that run by a mere 14 people, four of which are attorneys, is actually pretty amazing. So um, I know some of the uh, exempt employees are actually here, and I just want to thank you uh, for your work. And I apologize uh, for you know sometimes being under uh, underappreciated. Yes, yes, you can say oh, that's right. Who's next? I see a hand over here. Good evening. Hello. Name and address for the record. Eileen Moore, Fulton, Long Beach. I moved here in June of 2016. And since that time, I had my water bill increase, my home taxes increase, everything is increasing. I can't afford to live here anymore. And it's really on the fault of the decisions that are being made, the taxes, the increases, for all the decisions that you guys make, you're making them on my back. You're making them on their backs. Can you really believe that you want to put me out of my home? I came here to enjoy Long Beach. I came here to think that this is going to be a great community. And I'm really shocked by what I see up here. The lack of transparency, the lack of working together, and just asking the residents of Long Beach to agree with your plans to increase our cost of living here. I don't expect an answer. I've been coming here for three years, and I'm just appalled by what's going on in this town. I should have stayed in Queens. I should have stayed in New York City. But I really thought I was coming to a better standard of living. And it's been a great development. And it's all on you. Because you're running this town, you're responsible for it. I can't do anything. All I can do is either pay or put my house up for sale and move out. So what do you suggest I do? Thank you. Thank you. Is 
reserve budget line the anticipated revenue from the courts on fines. Okay. Most of you know me, I've been working here for a while. In a job, whatever, some fines come in, whatever it is. It is a joke what is going on down there. The city could be taking in so much more money on a daily basis on fines, legit fines, whether it's animal control, building, whatever. The workers are working, they're not getting the fines that are deserved. With that said, I'm hoping something can be worked out. I've spoken to numerous people about this before. Our lawyers down there, the ones that work with the city, do their due diligence and ask accordingly for what needs to be asked for and appropriately. The city's losing money now. Um, I really don't have much more to say on it. I just heard a couple of speakers up here before say that we're raising fines, this, that. It's not a case of raising fines. It's getting what is minimum, minimum fines, not knocking everything down to what it could or should or what it's really not. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, on the budget hearing? Okay. Any of the council have anything else to ask for Steve while the budget hearing is still open? No? Okay. Seeing no hands, I close the hearing. Hearing will continue at the next meeting. No. Okay, our second public hearing for tonight is the local wall amending the uh, amending subpart C of the related acts related to the charter of the city of Long Beach regarding a local law to override the tax levy limit established in general municipal law section 3C. So we have this is our annual ordinance regarding the tax cap override. The reason why this is necessary is really a function of our charter and the way it works. If the city council uh, enters or affirmatively votes for this budget and it takes effect and includes an any increase, alternatively, if it does nothing and wants to get to this budget, then the proposed budget goes into effect by default. Either way, it has to propose tax increase. Uh, the problem arises by virtue of the fact that if, um, if, that, if this proposed budget goes into effect one way or the other with that tax increase, it has to be to the cap. Um, we're obligated to collect that levy in full. So you collect the taxes, but you can't actually spend it. You have to put it in an escrow account and then refund it to the taxpayers later on, which may sound good in theory, but it's not because you've completely blown up your budget at that point. You don't have the revenue to pay for your expenses, and that's why this is an absolutely indispensable item, no matter what the city council ultimately chooses to do. This does not preclude the city council from modifying this budget or, uh, or effectuating a water sheet. Just to like, do all of those things, uh, both for the sake of for safety and taking every reasonable precaution available to us, it is essential that we will adopt this item. Um, Ms. Hightower, so there's a, there's a perception, in, you know, I think everyone has, that the tax cap is always 2%. Um, we generally think of that. Um, but actually, the tax cap is on the tax levy, not on the individual taxpayer. Um, so this year, the formula has changed. So what's the, the tax uh, levy percentage that would break the tax cap. So the tax levy cap this year is 2% as far as the, the levy goes. There is a little known piece of the levy is what's called the um, tax base growth factor, and that is what allows you to increase taxes for items that come back on the tax roll, such as how, for people who double the size of their house, or if it was a big and odd enough that they build a house on it. So to the extent that you have new taxpayers or increased value in the tax property, you're allowed to raise taxes to allow for those items. It's the only way for that long-term recovery re revenue stream of growing your taxes. But those, but those are to the rate to the taxpayer. Everything, everything relies on the levy. On the overall levy, isn't it less than 1% or something? Or? No, the levy itself is 2%. The levy itself is 2%. Yes, is and then the, the city has That changes or that's fixed? No, that changes every year based on CPI. It's either um, 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is lower. So I believe the rate of inflation was over 2% this year, but it's still capped at 2%. Okay, so 2% of the tax only equates to what for a rate payer? It depends on which one you're talking about, but in this fiscal year, um, a 
So I'm just trying to figure out, if we didn't bond this money, how would it affect the tax levy? And also, is it included within the formula by the New York State Comptroller's Office for us to actually, because bonding is normally done for either capital improvements or, or large plans over a succession of years, payments, not utilized normally for maintaining an operating budget. There is a section of the New York State local finance law that specifically allows city of Long Beach to borrow for separation payments over a longer term. And be, in, like capital. be included in the operating budget. Whether the, where the bonding is is where, the, is where the expenses are. So because the expenses are in the operating budget, the bonding is in the operating budget. Where the capital fund, the capital is in the capital budget. So that's where the bonding is, so that's why you don't see bonding in the operating budget. But if you give me a second option sure. for property tax. It would be an additional 4.3% property tax increase to not bond the separation payments. But those separation payments are not going to be over one year, they're going to be over three or five years, right? No, what's in the budget is next year's payments. So we're actually at a 11% realistically increase in tax levy? Or no? I'm just trying to figure out. No? Okay. So 3.5 is the magic number, right? And I'm here for that, and we're exceeding it. That's the yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on the tax cap? Anyone from the council have any other questions? Or any questions? No? Okay. Close the hearing. Okay, on to the regular calendar. Item 1 is the local law of Indian subpart C of related acts related to the charter of the city of Long Beach. Regarding local law to avoid the tax levy limit established in General Municipal Law 3C, a hearing has been held on this item already. Item 2 is a resolution establishing base proportions in accordance with provisions of Article 19 of the Real Property Tax Law. Okay, I'll ask our tax assessor to come up. I think we just uh, have a page on who we just did this. Yes, uh, good evening. This is Ray Flammer. Ray Flammer, tax assessor. Uh, this is the adjusted base proportions for the 1920 tax year. Uh, a few months ago, we passed it for the 1819. Uh, the reason this is going to be the earliest we've ever passed it is because we have state authorization to go uh, with the 1% adjusted base proportions. Uh, you know, base proportions are how we split the tax levy pie in between homestead and non-homestead classes. Uh, it's a complicated calculation that is overseen by the New York State Office for Property Tax Services. So they will check my math and everything else. Uh, this is good. Anyone from the council have any questions? Yes, yeah, quick question. We just did this on March 5th of last year. Yes. Uh, if I'm correct, we're shifting slightly away from homestead and towards non-homestead. That's correct. Right. Yes. Okay. It's about a two percent shift. The reason why is because the change in assessment. Uh, it's about two percent. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So anyone from the public have any questions? No. Seeing no hands. Next item. And three is resolution authorizing the publication for hearing of ordinance and regulatory ordinances in the city of Long Beach regarding water uh, and water distribution. Signs for publication only and hearing will be held by the 21st at 7 p.m. And the fourth resolution authorizes the publication for hearing of a local law amending the charter of the city of Long Beach regarding sewer rights. Signs for publication only and hearing will be held May 21st at 7 p.m. On to the voting. Item 1 is a local law amending subpart C of related acts related to the charter of the city of Long Beach regarding a local law to override the tax levy limit established in general municipal law section 3C. Who's going to be adopted this item? I will. Item 2 is a resolution establishing base proportions in accordance with the provisions of Article 19 of the Real Property Tax Law. Please move the adoption of this item. No. Second? No. Yes. Yes. 
Okay. Item three is a resolution authorizing publication for hearing of an ordinance to amend the code of ordinances of the city of Long Beach regarding order and order distribution. Okay. Finally, item four is a resolution authorizing publication for hearing of a local law amending the charter of the city of Long Beach regarding sewer rights. City Manager's Monthly Personnel Report has been filed by the City Clerk. We'll make a motion to close the meeting. I Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, I 
just want to comment that hiring CMA is a good step, but it does not mean that each city council member is not responsible to actually go through this entire budget to understand it and to ask questions. For example, the question that I asked earlier, has each city council member received a schedule which lists the $1.6 million payouts in this 2020 budget, in this 2020 budget? Respond. Have they? Have you? For the, for, the, for the next year's budget, it's $1.63 million for employee termination payouts. Has each of the city council members receive that so they can understand what's going on for next year. So they don't know. They will, okay. Um, Christy, uh, Ms. Top Hightower in the last budget meeting, the last meeting on May 1st said that there is going to be um, a deficit in the current year, fiscal year. That means you will have missed budget. That means you're over budget. That means you're lowering the general fund balance. Do the council members have that projection so that they know how we blew the budget this year? Do they have that yet? So when I come up here, I'm advocating for my elected officials to have the information they need to make responsible decisions. You're elected, you have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure you know what's in this budget. Each one of you, and you can't just pass it off to CMA now or to Rob. It's up to you, each of you, to understand it. And if my city council member that I, I vote for ask for information, they should get it. I don't care if they're Republican, Democrat, green or blue. They, if they have the right to ask for anything, anything, and they should get it. And they shouldn't have to, have to beg for it or have people come up here and scream it, at you for it. If they got the information they need to make informed decisions, it wouldn't be so tenuous every freaking meeting. Thanks.
that have the same safety things that every other street in Long Beach has. Just at every major intersection, they have directional traffic control for every direction, whether it's a one-way street or a two-way street, so that people can cross. When are we going to make it safe for those people that live there in the West End? I can tell you that I've lost thousands of dollars due to the damage to my house, my property, and my cars. What are we waiting for? Somebody to get killed? I just don't get it. What about the signs? 7.9 percent. You can put a couple signs up. Thank you, Mr. Lacko. Sales and 200 of which came from the LAR combo passes that we sold. 
So what? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, you said you were. Mr. Lester, please, 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 please let him finish. Please let him finish, Mr. Lester. So I'm, I'm aware of 700,000, and we, we, we dealt with it, we've itemized it, we've analyzed it. And this, every which way and sideways, and this is a very important part of this budget. So I think it's, that's our thing. I think it's a fair question. Um, and we've taken a lot of steps to proactively address that. The um, first and foremost of which is uh, the development of a comprehensive marketing plan to advertise the beach this year, which I'm going to call on Gordon Temple in a moment to discuss. But um, uh, in terms of the details of that marketing plan, there is some reliance, to be totally honest, on, on, on luck in terms of the weather. We've had absolutely awful weather for the last two summers, and we are relying on the love averages to an extent. Um, but where they say this is luck is when the uh, opportunity needs preparation. That's why we're that's what we're doing this market plan. Um, in addition, we had an agreement with the with the one ounce railroad to help boost the combo pack sales. They are going to keep my understanding is according to if I'm wrong. I believe we have an agreement uh, whereby they're going to be um, posting something on subway entrances all over Manhattan, basically uh, for free, uh, advertising our beach. And that's in the interest of seven combo passes because they get caught with that. Um, in addition, we are in the process of trying to work out how to separate arrangement with LPs. Of course, we still have some 12. I uh, think we'll get close. That will touch the beach this summer. And uh, in, addition, in addition to a number of other issues, we'll be going to just briefly run through the period. But you can understand. Remember when Mr. Diamond said we're at a hundred million dollars this year? You remember that. You were here. Um, that's that's why I guess. Right, I'm, I'm just here to try and work through that's where we are now. So uh, in terms of marketing and communications, they're essentially, I actually communicated to the council about this earlier today. There are essentially three different areas of media coverage or of media. So there's owned media, which is items that we post on our website or on our social media pages. Those are articles, press releases, things of that nature. There is earned media, which is what I've been responsible for the past seven years or whatever it would be. Articles in Newsday, we have ABC here, the Day New York does a show like the movie. And the other one is paid media, which we have not done a lot of. I'm actually a believer that our media is, is the best if you can get that, but it doesn't always work that way. So with the paid media this year, we're fortunate that we're going to have a $50,000 marketing plan uh, to promote the beach, promote our businesses. That is going to initiate in the coming days with a digital campaign that's including YouTube, pre roll Facebook, Instagram, various social media, social channels, probably some web banner ads. We're still in, uh, we're still finalizing some of the details of that, but it's going to start rolling out in May, and then we shift to a television format in June, starting around June 10th. It's going to run through the end of June and into July, and uh, these commercials are going to be geo-targeted. They're going to be targeted uh, and. The online can be targeted even, even better because uh, various, I'm going to get two of the leads on this, but there are, there are ways that you can determine who you would want to target to come to the beach based on their web usage and things like that. We're going to be on Altice, we're going to be on Fios, we're going to be on various uh, platforms that are not available here locally that may be in Queens or around with or uh, other areas that we deem uh, potential targets for beach goers. Um, and I think, you know, very, very simply put, if you're in this general area and you're somebody who might want to come to Long Beach, you're going to know that we're open for business. If you're watching the Met game or the Yankee game, there's going to be a commercial about Long Beach. It's going to spotlight, so spotlight us, it's going to put us in positive light. And at the same time, we're going to continue to push hard for all the other channels that we've done. We just had a great feature in the Newsday Magazine last week. Uh, the New York Times did a big story about our real estate market last month. We have, we're, Cat out of bag, we're working on a number of different initiatives. Um, as Rob said, a lot of from preparation meets opportunity. That's my quote in the high school year book or something. But, um, you know, we need, we need good weather this summer. We need a perfect storm, not the type of a super storm like Sandy, but like good weather, good advertising, good articles, positive stories about the city of Long Beach. Um, and I think that we're well on our way. Uh, just looking at our plans that we have, and I'll send something to the council to put something on them. But I believe that the beach revenue will be better this year. Thank you. I just have to go ahead. All right, just a, just a quick question. So, so, so you, sure. you, you can sit down. So, oh, sorry, okay. second to you. All right. Uh, so, it was Mr. Lester's point that. So, we know we're somewhat dependent on beach revenues, obviously. Um, and, and also to the point with the proposed versus uh, asked on, on some of these. If we saw 
start seeing, whether it's weather-related beach revenue mm -hmm. or labor costs from whatever, all the time, what kind of controls are we going to be putting in place when we start seeing variances growing from budget? Are we talking about uh, beach revenue or? Well, if we see beach revenue starts coming in, you know, bad weather, so we see beach revenues falling below expectations, or the overtime costs are exceeding expectations, you know, the budget versus action. We haven't been good in the past at putting controls in place. What are we going to change now? Well, uh, you know, I think the commission, with respect to overtime, in particular, the commission tag did start a, a, a new policy last year that we're looking to maintain where where we found it sort of a unique way to ensure that the vision heads are, are not just assigning overtime in a sort of scattershot way, but rather as the need arises. And we found a way to make the vision head specifically accountable. Um, and it arises under the civil service law, actually. So when, when they are assigned overtime, which they shouldn't be, we have the ability to improve that. That practice started last year, and we found it had a very, a very, uh, uh, had, it, it produced a desired effect, is what I'm trying to say. And the operating income thing was $140,000 this year. So we're trying to move the needle from, from both sides. Right. Um, to the extent we can, obviously. It's, it is a work of progress, to be perfectly honest with you. In terms of beef of revenue and the weather in particular, um, that's something that is going to require some adjustment to a market. Yes. Uh, 
terms of last week's meeting, I believe everybody did the math. No, just leave it at that. But there was an extensive, extensive review of all the documents. Of all the documents that were already paid and the ones that... I'm talking about this past year's separation pay and the, uh, and the supplement that we just did the last council meeting. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, now that we're so messed up, will you now declare a moratorium on hiring and raises over what is already contractual? More to stop hiring unnecessary hires. Well, I don't speak about personnel, but if you are hiring people, there's a very large list, and I understand that the um, beach needs to hire people, and that's probably why that list is so long this time. But it, it seems like every month, there's a board, every two weeks, there's a lot of people being hired, and also some people are getting raises. That's the that's the uh, the wording of the part time staff that occurs every every summer. I'm not talking about this one in particular. I'm talking about. Have you looked into who is taking cars home and using them as personal vehicles? I have not yet. I can tell you that. That would be good. The subject of mandatory negotiation. Good, because we have a lot of cars here. That, that's your time this session. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, I yeah. just. The, okay, the, you know the these are the questions you were going to answer. The, the, right. the fines that you were talking about that were spoken about earlier, I just yeah. want to clarify that. I think I understand what um, Mr. Shu was talking about. He was talking about, um, you know, someone gets a fine and says a minimum of X amount of dollars. I know, they I know. Court, but and then the I thought this was makes related. It $20. So I think that's what Mr. Shu was referring to, is that the, the massive decrease in fines uh, that are, uh, end up being, uh, was it given? I was actually not referring to Mr. Shu, but somebody, I think Mr. Agostini said that in some, maybe it was in the um, program, that we're going to... And I think that's what he was talking about. Yeah, so I'm saying aside from the $20 fine, we should look into people who sue us for $100,000 and make sure that they're reading the some, signs. Some of the fines were not $20, the building department fines, and all those would be very, very high. Because um, there's a lot of ways we could be right. bringing money in. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Pinto. Mr. Gosler. Good evening again, Jay Gosler. Uh, I'd just like to comment on the, the new, I know you don't say it, you say it on the rule, but I'm going to quote the new, new three-minute rule that went into effect in January. Uh, it's my observation that since the implementation of this rule that hundreds of questions have gone unanswered. Um, I'd like to know why, and I'd like to suggest that this should prove that that rule was developed and that is a mechanism to avoid answering the public questions. Uh, last week, I believe, uh, two weeks ago, I asked whether or not the fair activity had made any payments of any kind to the city. We still haven't gotten an answer. It's pretty straightforward. It's a yes or it's a no. Uh, the city's uh, refusal to answer that question, in, in my mind, strongly infers that uh, there may have been some payments that those payments may have been improper. Uh, I also asked the council at the last meeting to direct Mr. Agassiz to provide a copy of his employment agreement uh, that he entered into with the city first in December of 2016, and then he had, it was, has subsequently been amended. Um, I put you guys on notice that uh, Mr. Agostini, while the city's lawyer, uh, induced his client, that's you guys, to enter into an illegal agreement. He then concealed the existence of the agreement and still refuses to provide it, despite there being numerous proper FOIL requests having been made for can counsel explain its inaction to this issue? And Mr. Agostini says that he doesn't, hasn't entered into an illegal agreement on falsely accusing him. He's certainly welcome to sue me for that accusation. Thank you, Mr. Gustler. Uh, that's it for this evening. Thank everyone for coming. Please get home safe.